Hey folks, welcome back from break. I hope you all managed to get a coffee or tea, whatever your choice is. Um, uh, now we are moving over to, so there's been a slight change of the agenda. Hopefully you've all noticed that. Uh, so we, we're staying with just one track, track one for now. Then we'll split onto two tracks at 12.15. Um, due to, as, as Paula said earlier, due to one of our speakers unfortunately being ill. Um, so now it's, it's you know, really looking forward to introducing Nigel uh, Poulton, who's going to have a bit of a, uh, what we're calling an ANA, ask Nigel anything. Um, but just to keep him in track, we've got our own Adrian Muat, who's going to be there to keep him, keep him in order uh, uh, and keep an eye on questions and stuff. So really looking forward to, to listening to this chat with, with the two guys. So who's speaking first then, Adrian? You or me? Okay, so <laughs> I think that was my cue and I completely missed it. I didn't. Hey, we're all good. Yeah, it's like we've never, ever done this before, eh? Um, yeah, welcome to Nigel. Um, so Nigel Poulton, um, I'm not sure you need much of an introduction. Um, author, trainer, perhaps most famous for the Kubernetes book. Um, and I think that's actually a good place to start. Um, because I have written a book myself. Um, so I'm aware of how much work it is, but I think the fantastic thing you've done with like the Kubernetes book and the Docker book and so on is that you've kept it um, up to date. So you, you've done a lot of work continuously updating it. Um, and I just wonder if you want to, to talk about that for a second and, and uh, what that was like and how much uh, work it takes. Yeah, absolutely, mate. It's, um, it's an absolute pain in the rear end to keep up to date. I say to people all the time, right, that... Um, I would absolutely love to write a book about technology that you can stick on the shelf or on Amazon or whatever, yeah? And it'd be relevant for five years um, because it's so much effort to actually write a book. Um, but something like Kubernetes, I, I do feel it's changing a little bit, right? But something like Kubernetes and containers and stuff that just seems to iterate so fast, um, it's really hard work. So I know when I first released the Kubernetes book, um, I think it might have been the first book on Kubernetes. I can't remember. It was certainly the first or second, um, and so was my Docker book. But um, when I released it, it originally had 15,000 words, so one 5,000. Um, and I was update. well, the first year, I think I updated it three times. Um, and then I was updating it twice a year. And now I'm on to just annual updates. So, so the, the pain of actually keeping the content up to date um, is less for me now because I do feel like Kubernetes as a project has matured. Um, but one of the things I do with the book is I only tend to talk about things that are generally available or V1, yeah, stable. Um, and, and back in the day when I first released the book, that wasn't a great deal of things. And that's why it was 15,000 words. I think it's 70,000 words or just over 70,000 words now. Um, and that's a reflection of how Kubernetes has matured um, because again, I'm only talking about things that are stable. I mean, like, look, you would know, and, and everybody on the call will know that if we were to try and cover in books, everything that Kubernetes does, like, I, I don't know, it would make the collected works of Shakespeare or whatever look small and interesting as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's fun to write a book because, um, you know, you get to interact with a lot of people and you get to influence a lot of people's lives and careers. And that's really um that's it can be a special thing in a humble way um but it, it was originally painful writing a kubernetes book and keeping it up to date and it's it still kind of is but it's not as bad as it used to be that's for sure yeah yeah hey just, i've got a, a quick question for you do you want me to share my screen yeah sure so i think we have some there's a little bit of housekeeping you can um, right. send us your questions for nigel so i think nigel has kindly prepared a slide with some more information on where to go to to um, share such information. So do you want to, to go ahead, Nigel? Yeah, so make sure I share the right screen. So desktop number two here. Um, you should see my slide, yeah. Getting started with Kubernetes, ask me anything. I'm, I'm assuming that we see that. Um, get, let's have the feedback if you don't. I'm gonna just move on one slide though. Um, so basically for this presentation it is, yeah, it's an ask Nigel anything, but it's actually, Adrian doesn't really know this. It's an ask Nigel and Adrian anything. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have had some questions come in from Twitter and on LinkedIn already. Um, however, we've got some places that you can ask more questions right now um, at the bottom. 
So I'm going to move on another slide. So this is me. Um, I, I've written some Docker and Kubernetes books. We, we've kind of talked about them. You can get them everywhere that you would expect to be able to get a book. I don't want really the focus to be on that. I want it to be on asking the questions. So I'm just going to slide it on to the first question. And I am like, I'm super interested in your take on all of these as well, Adrian. We can make it like, you know, we're having a chat and everybody else is involved in the chat by asking the questions. I know that you've got to kind of monitor the different channels and stuff, maybe a little bit closer than I've got to. Um, but we, we had somebody ask, will Kubernetes be easy? I didn't put who's asked this one, actually. Maybe I, I made a note of it. I know I didn't for that one. Um, so I know when I talked about the book there, we said that like, at least writing the book is easier because Kubernetes as a project has got more stable. Um, but I think to this question, there's like, there's so many angles. The first one that I always used to sort of struggle with is like getting Kubernetes. Like if you wanted to build it yourself, DIY Kubernetes, that, that was always really hard. And I always felt like you almost needed to be a Linux kernel engineer to be able to build like a production grade Kubernetes cluster. Um, I feel like the hosted options on all of the different clouds that we have out there now really made on ramping to Kubernetes or getting it in the first place or getting a production grade Kubernetes cluster. And I, use, I always use production grade in air quotes because it means different things to different people. Um, but I feel like getting Kubernetes now is way, way easier than it used to be. But I still feel like we're not where we need to be. I do feel like the cloud vendors probably are. But if you want to build your own on-premises Kubernetes cluster and make it highly available and high performance and, and then be able to like keep it up to date going forward, um, I really don't feel like we are there yet. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that actual like process of getting Kubernetes at all, Adrian? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think we need to split into two things. You seem to have like uh, kind of focused on how hard it is to actually get Kubernetes up and running. Yeah. And you're, I think you're spot on. Like if you use like AWS or GCP and the, the, you know, they've got the managed things like JKE and so on, yeah. it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, but the, what's really hard is like the main ongoing maintenance. Yeah, uh, and that's why Google have is it autopilot they called it. I that's can't right, remember. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, the, the main thing I see in the complexity is just Kubernetes tries to be everything to everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's got so many use cases it covers. Um, so I don't think Kubernetes itself will ever be easy, but I think what we might start seeing is like platforms on top. So. I think a lot of enterprises, and I think that this is already happening. You see enterprises um, with their own platform as a service, basically. So they yeah. have platform teams that basically make Kubernetes easy for the developers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's maybe the direction it will go in. Yeah, so I've, I've often thought about that, that at some point, um, I really believe that Kubernetes will just be there and that it won't be this thing that you almost even have to think about. It'll just be like, you know, we're deploying our applications and, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything that we need to do with that around scaling and the ability to self-heal the applications and stuff. And it will hopefully be like, oh, and by the way, did you realize that under the hood, yeah, it is Kubernetes that's going on there so that organizations and certainly application development teams can, can just write their applications. This cloud native way becomes the way to write them. And, and they're not thinking about like, how do I hook it into Kubernetes? And there's not like necessarily this big infrastructure team that's like, we're constantly managing the Kubernetes layer. I just, I feel like, and we're, we're really not there yet, but we are aiming to a point where maybe it's a spin on the, you know, um, Kubernetes needs to be boring as in, oh, yeah, it's just there and it just works and it's maybe installed as part of something else or, or, or what have you. Um, I think as well, though, aside from the infrastructure, I know with a lot of um, enterprise organizations, especially like the more, um, those that like slower to adopt new technologies, they're always asking like, you know, what, what, what's my biggest challenges when, when I come to deploy it? And, and how do I have to retrain my teams? Not from an infrastructure perspective, but like to, to think about how to, de you know, develop and, and refactor those existing applications and new applications because it is like there's there's an infrastructure side of it you've got to be able to to have like that high performance highly available infrastructure layer that kubernetes is a big part of but then you've also got to be able to have your teams write the applications 
to fit that because I, I know that Docker did this a while ago with the ability to, or, or like a service to port like your legacy monolithic applications in place and run them on Docker. And you got like some benefits doing that, but to get the full benefits, it is like really a rethink of how you do your applications. And that, that still seems hard to me, certainly for enterprises. They're like, how do we do that? What, what, what do our application teams need to change in their, in their, their mindsets and change in the way that, you know, and what, what needs to change in the pipelines and things that they've gotten. There's just seems to be a ton of complexity there as well. Yeah, there's certainly plenty of complexity. Um, do you have a slide? You've taken over the questions, Nigel. Do you have a slide for the next question? Um, no. So what I was going to do was, <laughs> if you had a question, I, I will just edit this slide on the go oh, um, cool. and put in what the latest question is. If we don't have any new ones that come in, we've got some from Twitter. So, we do already. Say again? We do already have new questions. We're not yeah, going let, to Let's have a new question then. <laughs> hey, what, to do one, that, okay. Go on That's then. What is it? You shout it out and I'll type it up. <laughs> okay. So Tom Kivlin asked on the Slack, what sort of change or feature would trigger a 2.0 release for Kubernetes? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm writing this up right now. What sort of change or feature would trigger a 2.0 release of Kubernetes? Right, so excuse any potential typos that come here, right? Whoops, wrong slide. Yeah, um, nobody got one on that slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've, um, okay. See, that I'm not sure how well this is going to work. We're about to find out. Here we go. Right, if I go present again, hopefully everybody should see. the next. So what, what kind of change or feature would trigger a 2.0 release? So I'm going to give my, like, really easy answer here, right? Like, hopefully nothing ever, um, just because it sounds like such a, well, look, a move to a, and I'm assuming we're talking, like, instead of going Kubernetes 1.22, 1.23, we decided at some point this is going to be Kubernetes 2.0. Um, and that sounds like such a horrific breaks everything type release that I don't think anybody wants it. Uh, and it's a funny thing. Look, I could be totally wrong. And I'm really keen on your thoughts on this as well, Adrian. But I think traditionally for me, when you've looked at things like um, Linux and Windows and stuff like that, and they do these almost huge breaking releases where it's a, you know, it's a big, I know it's not quite the same, right? But going from whatever it was, Windows Vista to Windows 8 or Windows 10 or whatever, I could never find the control panel or the printer and things like that. And that's a, it's a bit of a pain. Okay. But when you're running line of business applications on such a, a an important platform as Kubernetes is becoming, if your applications suddenly can't find the control panel or the printer, you know, you know what I mean, right? Um, the, the APIs and things that have changed so much that you have a hell of a lot of work to put in to make your applications work. I don't know what the appetite is for that. And I had, you know, I came into the world of containers and Kubernetes and um, thinking myself, like, you know, when will we get a 2.0? Surely we're not going to be at version 1.230 in like 10 years. Um, but I, I kind of wonder whether w we might from like a main Kubernetes um, like release channel. Um, things like, I mean, even just things like pods and deployments and stuff going from a one, a version one to a version two would be really hard. But at least in that, they could deprecate the, let, let's say Kubernetes 1.30, and I'm making this up, right? Um, has like something super core, like pods or services go to, instead of being V1 API, go to V2, right? The, the V1 would be deprecated for like a million releases first because it's so core. Um, so I think it's almost a, a mindset change to say that something as fundamental as this for like a Kubernetes 2.0, and look, I could look like a fool here, and we could get to Kubernetes 2.0 next year. Um, and, and if that happens, then I'll be trolling the internet and deleting every comment of me saying this. Um, but I just almost feel like that's, that's just not the way we'll go going forward. I, I, and feel free to disagree with, with me. I don't know what you think on that. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable point of view. Um, there's a couple of things there. One, I'm not, I, I'd have to ask a Kubernetes you know, core developer um, exactly what the, um, the, you know, the, the different releases actually signify. Um, but at the same time, we do want to, you know, allow space for innovation and change. Um, 
I suspect like Kubernetes 2.0 would, you know, might end up be a, a, being a completely different product. Um, yeah. Can you, can you imagine? See, I do think there is space for that innovation and new things with the way that individual APIs mm -hmm. within Kubernetes, like pods or services or um, the gateway API or things like that, they can iterate almost at their own cadence. And, and, and we know that within Kubernetes, you can run different versions of, of the API for different features. Um, like we had, like, for instance, I think um, like deployments is a really common one as well. That's been V1 for a while, but it was like um, V1 beta 1 and V1 beta 2 were all still available within Kubernetes for like the longest time. So it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I, I still hold to hopefully nothing will ever take us to that point, but we'll see. If we, if we could make it smooth, then I wouldn't, I, whoops, then I wouldn't be worried. Cool. Okay, I've got another great question. It kind of follows on. Um, so on Twitter, Ram Prasad asked, will serverless replace Kubernetes? Oh, right. Okay. So will serverless replace Kubernetes? Maybe well, you start typing. Um, you, get, you start I giving can, your I can answer give an answer, but I, I'm, I don't, it's really about your session. But um, what I would say is the first thing I'd point out is that it's quite reasonably common to run sort of serverless on top. Of Kubernetes, yeah. So I see Kubernetes future being sort of as an infrastructure layer, yeah. um, and quite often running serverless workloads, especially for for on-prem customers. Yeah, I feel like almost. Now I don't want to put words in Ramprasad's mouth here, but it's all. It feels like the question is more like, will serverless replace containers? Um, because I think I, I would agree with you from a Kubernetes perspective. Um, Kubernetes, you know, for the most part manages containers, but you know, there, there are ways to have it manage serverless workloads and virtual machine workloads and things like that. So um, I, I certainly, I don't see Kubernetes going away. And I think that's important for anybody that is looking to get started. Like as an individual, if you're thinking, um, is Kubernetes a good thing for me to bet my career on? As in like, do I want to put in the time and, and potentially money to invest in Kubernetes skills? I think you're fairly safe there because there's such a strong ecosystem and all of the major um, cloud providers and people out there, the major tech companies are either offering Kubernetes services or are building tools that, that hook into Kubernetes. So the future is bright if it's, you know, if we're talking about Kubernetes, um, but also for an organization as well. If an organization is saying we're wanting to make a technology better at the infrastructure layer that we don't want to have to invest in today and rip out or replace in two years' time. We want this to have a strong roadmap. I do feel like Kubernetes has a super strong roadmap. So with this being at like a getting started with Kubernetes session, if you're an individual or an organization and you're sort of umming and ahhing and being like, well, should we, shouldn't we go down the Kubernetes route? Of course, this is just my opinion and you know your career and your business units and stuff way better than I do. But I do feel like Kubernetes is a solid choice. So I don't feel like serverless or anything else is going to wipe it away. Um, I would go with, with what you said, really, Adrian, that um, Kubernetes is going to manage serverless workloads um, rather than serverless workloads replace Kubernetes. Now, will serverless workloads replace containers? Um, my opinion on that also is no. Um, and I feel super confident on that in as much as like, We've still got mainframes out there. Like I spent a lot of time working in retail banking in the UK and, and no joke, millions and millions of pounds or euros or dollars were spent every year on mainframe infrastructure and not rusty old stuff with dust on, on the top of it, you know, like brand new mainframes at the core of a lot of businesses with open systems around that and virtual machines and now containers and stuff. So I would say that even if the question is, will serverless replace containers? Like the, for me, it's no. Um, they'll be shoulder to shoulder in just about every IT estate in the next two, three, four, five, ten years, in my opinion. Okay, actually, that brings. Um, we don't need a, a slide for this, but uh, related to what you were just saying there, um, yeah. how do you keep your skills up to date when Kubernetes is so complex and has oh, yeah. so many releases? Uh, and I realize part of the answer is buy your book, but. Yeah. Um, one second. I'm just going to... No, I don't know if we just slide for that one. You, oh, no. I, just in case anybody's joining late. Okay. Go for it. Um, 
Um, the, the reason that I don't dislike it is just because I don't have a good answer. All right. Okay. Do you, yeah, do you know what? Yeah. The, look, I say this all the time because look, I teach people Kubernetes and containers um, and I do very much feel like, and I apologize for anybody who's heard me say this before, but I feel like we live in a golden age of learning new technologies. Like if I wind the clock back to when I was doing my MCSE in Windows NT4, or even, even like my Netware certification that I never got, but, but I was working towards years ago, I had to go to my boss and beg him to loan me a spare PC from work. And the PC, it was one of these massive old compact things that had a monitor that you almost needed a forklift truck to lift. Um, and I, I was installing, I think, you know, Windows NT4, I might even have had it on floppy disks as well, but certainly either floppy disks or CDs. And, and anytime you would break anything and breaking stuff is a great way to learn, right? Um, it would be like, let's rebuild the NT domain. And that's like four hours of waiting for Windows to build. We're not there anymore. We're like, if you want to learn Kubernetes, you can install Minikube or Docker Desktop or, or a ton of different things on your laptop. Boom, like that. You've got, um, okay, it might not be a production grade Kubernetes cluster, but um, I, you know, I'd go so far as to say, even with something like K3D or K3S, you almost can because you can have like a multi-node Kubernetes cluster on your laptop that you can trash and rebuild in like a couple of minutes. And even if that's a bit too hard for you, you can go to like most of the major cloud providers and get some free credit in most places to spin up Kubernetes on their infrastructure and just play about with it till your heart's content. And then of course, like, okay, so I think that my Kubernetes book back in 2016 or 17 was the first one. But there's flipping loads, excuse me, but there's, there's loads now. Like you're, you're almost spoiled for choice with books and with video training courses, with hands-on platforms that will walk you through how to do it. It's like today, um, and I, I mean this respectfully, okay, um, but there are no longer any excuses to not learn something like Kubernetes. It's not hard. You don't have, like that, that PC that I borrowed from my boss, um, Literally, I put it on a, a makeshift table in the corner of our bedroom when I was first married and I had a really tiny house. And when you turned it on, the fans were really loud. My wife was like, really, do we need that? <laughs> it, it, no, no, but the world's not like that anymore. It's so easy to actually get your hands on and the resources are out there. And you come to events like this and you do Twitter and stuff like that. You ask people, I think you get answers. So I think it's. I'm not Kubernetes is hard to learn, but the tools to help you learn it have never been better than they are now. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that's a great answer. It actually leads on to a question from Bruno Gabriel da Silva, and I think we can keep the slides so still in context. Okay. And he says, What's the difference for you learn it, about learning from a book or video classes? Um, I, I, yeah. I'll maybe go first. Yeah, I would on. say it's different strokes of different folks. Yeah. Like I, I actually, I would have said, like Bruno, that I get more from books most of the time, especially for going deeper reference. But I find myself watching videos quite a lot recently, and I've really enjoyed like um, Clustered by Raw Code and so on, and I've definitely learned stuff from that. I don't know what your take is. Yeah, so I, I definitely think, um, I think a combination of the two is the best, and I'm really not just saying that because I, I offer both. But I feel, I like a book, and I actually I like a paperback book versus something like an ebook or a Kindle. Um, it might be just because of the age I grew up in, but I feel like a book I can make notes and I can scribble and I can have it on the desk there and I can easily flip to a page um, and find, you know, some notes that I made. And I, I can't do that with a video course. Yeah. Um, so what, here's what I recommend to people. So I do recommend that I recommend both because I think um, multiple ways of learning something, hearing something and reading it yourself, one cements or, or concretes the other. Um, but people that are studying for an exam, this is the, the advice I give them, right, is I say, take the book, okay? Read the book, make your notes in it, and um, follow along with the examples. Super important to follow along with the examples, especially if you're going to take like a practical exam. But then maybe the day or two before the exam, then watch the video course that goes with the book or is similar to it as like almost a refresher, a reminder, because I feel like, I can watch a video course and really enjoy it and the humor and it feels like it's more interactive and it's a different way for me as a video course creator to be able to present content. 
But when I watch video calls, I quite often feel that like, I almost can't remember this stuff afterwards. Where, and it's harder to go back than it is in a book and just read a quick paragraph yeah. that I made a note against. Um, so yeah, I would advise both. Um, but if you are preparing for an exam, book and follow the examples with your hands on and then either an audio version of the book or, or a video course as like a, a refresher because taking exams, and I know the question wasn't necessarily about that, but when you take an exam, I'm not a fan of like really working hard the night before and in the car, that uh, you've got an extra five minutes before I have to go into the testing center or it's in, it's in your room now at home, isn't it? Um, I'm more of a like, take a chill and get yourself relaxed before it. And that relaxation, it, perfect way to do it is just stick the video course on. Don't stress yourself about trying to remember. Just let it play, enjoy it, have a bit of fun. Cool. Okay, I think we should get back to an actual Kubernetes question. Um, we're starting to run out of time now. All right. Um, but Tim Bannister asked on the Kubernetes Slack or CNCF Slack, what things outside of Kubernetes proper need to get better in order to make the overall container orchestration story more effective? Um, so, Right, so I've, I've kind of summarized the question because that's far too much for me to type. <laughs> yeah. um, but let, let me just, uh, and what please tell me, of- right, if you don't think um, I, I'm answering to the question. So I've put what things outside of Kubernetes need to get better. Um, okay, so I, th- I think, right, the number one thing outside of Kubernetes on a technology perspective that you need to go into production is a service mesh. Um, so, and I'm not necessarily saying they all need to get better. Well, I look, that they do it. And, and, and everything, look, even if, even if they're great, we always want to be striving towards getting better, don't we? Um, so I would say you in production need a service mesh and some of the service meshes in particular need to get better. But again, it's really difficult. Like we talked about Kubernetes before, these service meshes are trying to do a lot of things for us and you don't just build that overnight and make it simple overnight. So I'm I'm not criticizing any of the service mesh um, communities or or, um, vendors or or anything like that. Um, But I think service mesh is important and it needs to get better. Um, If I could take like a non-technical one as well, but it is coming back to something we suggested before, is that I feel like organizations structurally need to get better. Um, So to be able to go cloud native, you really need to rethink your organizational structure, the way you you, um, build teams of developers and the way that they interface with each other and the way that they interface with the infrastructure teams and other people like that. That really is like a key thing because it's not just about technology. um, It's about process and things as well. So my two things will be service mesh and then like organizational structures. And don't get me wrong, like there's a a list that we could go on for forever as well. Yeah, Yeah, my boss would love to hear you saying that about organizational (laughs) structure because that's absolutely what we sort of focus on at Container yeah. Solutions. Um, but what I would say um, is I would actually tie it into another question we got asked on Twitter, which is which we didn't want to answer because it's too complicated. Oh, yeah. It's like Owen Holland's asked, how do you maintain and upgrade your clusters? Uh, and also ah. at scale up and down. And I think that's something that, you know, we still need to work on. Um, I think yeah. GitOps is probably part of an answer there, at least. Possibly, yeah. I, I really don't feel like we're there for that. Um, and I'll take, I'll take two angles on that and they may be cheap angles. Okay. The first one is I do feel if you go the cloud route, like a managed or a hosted Kubernetes service, like EKS or GKE or Linode Kubernetes engine, whatever. Um, the, and I'm not speaking to particular hosted services here, right? But I feel like the cloud vendors almost have those kernel engineers on staff that do that hard work for you. Um, I know for instance, with GKE, like, um, in the early days, you, you, it was, you didn't really have much of a choice with regards to upgrades, whereas at least now that they offer you, you can you know, go on the rapid channel if you want to, or you can go on the more stable channel. So, so they're, they're giving you more dials and knobs and buttons to press and stuff to help you with that. Uh, and they really make it quite a lot simpler. I think the other thing is that I feel like, and, and I don't want to speak out of place here because I know that the maintainers and the community do an incredible job. Um, but I really, well, I feel like moving from 
um, four releases a year to three is a step in the right direction. It make it makes it easier for, for people, you know, when there's not four new releases a year, elongating the support window for older releases as well. But I would love to see us move towards something for the enterprise in particular, like a long-term stable, like we have with Ubuntu and, and plenty of other products, actually, where there's like a particular release that we target that we say this one is going to be um, supported by the community and, and vendors will, will pick up additional support as well for a longer period of time and we will provide a smoother path to get to the next long-term stable release for customers so from a customer perspective i think like the easy option at the moment or the easiest option at the moment is is hosted kubernetes um, and I, I really hope that the community going forward will make strides so that um you know even if you're doing your own on-premises stuff diy kubernetes that that the process gets easier yeah i think that's an excellent answer um i think we need to hand back now am i right yeah danny <laughs> I, I think we're out of time but i, I can't right, keep going more questions no that's okay i think we're doing okay on time um I, I, I actually, your, your point about self-learning actually really resonated with me, um, Nigel, because um, obviously that's, that's kind of, uh, I've, I've spent like over a decade hunting for information online and um, moving in and out of IRC channels very early on. And I know people before me probably had to go fishing on Usenet for information uh, around, around technology. So it definitely has gotten a lot easier. Um, but I think the tools are there. It's also a lot more noisy though as well. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's also much harder to get people's attention. But I thought, yeah, really enjoyed your um, ask Nigel or anything. So that was that was quite good. Um, so uh, I guess I, you know, typically we'd use this time to ask questions. But the whole point of your <laughs> uh, the whole the whole point of your uh, session was was asking questions. So I think we have another four. Five minutes before our next speaker joins. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I have a question. I have a question that probably is a bit too big to answer. So we might, you might want to take this to Slack or something. Whoa. But you mentioned that service meshes are essential going into production. That's one of the things you need. Maybe not essential. That's not the word you yeah. use. Sorry. You said that service meshes are something you need to go into production. Yeah. Uh, and that's just an interesting, an interesting thought because I don't see many. I don't see. I see people still playing with service meshes, but lots of people already in production. Yeah. So, so let me take that for a couple of minutes, right? And, and I don't know what Adrian's thoughts are as well. Is So I feel like what a lot of service meshes bring, um, a production um, installation of Kubernetes is almost crying out for it. And if you can do it at day one, then, then all the better for you. Excuse me. I just think like, you know, the whole sort of, microservices design for applications where all of your different application features are now communicating over a network. And I'm, I'm picking some low hanging fruit here, right? Um, you know, they're, they're not communicating over shared memory on a, on, on a single host anymore. It's much more dangerous now that all that chat is going over the network. So um, the ability to almost have visibility into your network, um, the ability to sort of um, have your network almost learn. Maybe I'm getting towards eBPF here a little bit more, but also that ability to, at the infrastructure layer, encrypt communication from pod to pod or container to container, however you want to think about it, and not have to ask your application developers to say, we need you in like your, um, your containers that we're asking you to build and make them single purpose. Could you actually just go and put this... Um, you know, encryption, decryption stuff in there as well, please. Um, I really feel like, you know, the fact that a service mesh will offer all of those things and more as you go to like proper production. And I may be, uh, my view of it may be tainted. Um, but I'm not a fan of that word, actually. Um, <laughs> because I spent so much time in retail banking where they're like so obsessed about like security and what have you. So I don't see many of my prior organizations wanting to dive into something like containers and Kubernetes in a distributed microservices architecture without the features that a service mesh brings. No, no, makes sense. Thank you. 
Cool. So, um, so thank you very much, Nigel, and thanks, Adrian, for um, for moderating as well. Uh, that was that was great.